Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here again with uh, another video in our series of Forgotten Players of the Past. And today's lecture is going to be about the American player Abraham Kupchik. And one of the reasons I thought of Kupchik, and one of the reasons I've heard of him, is because he actually played some blitz chess against my dad uh, in New York City at one of the chess clubs there. Maybe the Marshall, maybe the Manhattan, I'm not sure. Uh, could have been another one. But this was in the 60s. My dad told me um, he didn't know who he was playing. And eventually he found out it was Kupchak. And Kupchak beat my dad pretty easily. Kupchak was one of the top 10 players in the U.S. in the 20s, 30s, and maybe in the 40s. And obviously in the 60s, he was quite elderly, but he was still better than my dad. My dad was probably about <clears throat> between 25 and 30 years old. You know, a, a master player, but okay, not, not top 10 in the U.S., and um, yeah, so I, I found some information about Kupchik and he actually played a match with Bogolyubov, who was a famous chess player, in 1924. They played a six-game match where Kupchik had a win, three losses, and two draws. So Bogolyubov won the match. But I want to show you the game Kupchik won. And uh, I mean, when I looked at the game today, I was thinking... That's how I play when I play well. So when I was at my peak playing strength, this is the kind of game that I would win against a weaker player. Although Bogoyabov is probably a stronger player. Um, so I guess this was not Bogoyabov's best game. This was Bogoyabov's only loss in the match. So I guess he, he played his worst. But, but what's funny about this game is Bogoyabov played the Bogo Indian. So there you go. Named after Bogoyabov. So kind of like that. And they played a very, I would say, tame line. Not, you know, lots of trading, not, not a lot of um, interesting attacking moves and threats. Just, you know, a lot of trading of the pieces. And I think Bogolyubov just about equalized. Um, he played F5 because that was the style at the time. And Kupchik, unlike me, played long castles. And I've had these kinds of positions with White all my life because I'm always playing white and Bogo Indians and Queens Indians and Nimzo Indians and Queens Gambit declines. So I get these pawn structures a lot. And I don't castle Queenside very often. Okay, so more trading um, of stuff and traded almost everything. Okay, now here, white would like to cheat and play the move knight e4. That's where the knight belongs. Blockading the e-pawn in the center, can't be attacked by the pawn. And the obvious way to do it is knight d2 to e4, but you can't play, well, you could play knight d2, but then you would lose your f-pawn. So that explains Kupchik's next move, rook h to f1, defending his f-pawn. Now he can play knight d2 to e4, which, frankly, I don't see how to prevent. Okay, so Bogolyubov decided to batten down the hatches and just play for equality and solidity and not let white do anything. Instead of doing something aggressive himself, he played b6. Okay, and uh, f3 solidifying when the knight goes to e4. The rook on f1 doesn't have to protect the pawn anymore. And black is just chilling and saying, you can't break through. This position should just be a draw because nothing much is happening. Okay, and Kup Kupchik tries. He moves his king up, attacks the h-pawn. He stops it. Black doesn't have much to do. Black defends his a-pawn. So white doesn't play king b4 and take the pawn. Okay, rook to e2, preparing to double the rooks on some file. And probably more importantly, defend the pawns on b2 and g2. Those are the only pawns that aren't defended by a pawn. So now his king can run around, his other pieces can run around. So rook e2 is pretty safe. Rook a5, that doesn't do very much. Okay, nothing much going on. Knight c3. Now, this is very serious White can play knight b5 and take the c-pawn, or White could take the a-pawn. So he's moved his knight away from the, from the powerful... Um, I keep making moves by accident. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the powerful knight on e4, he's moving it to c3 because he wants to attack these weak pawns. Okay, so he plays the move rook to d4, and... That move is probably not a very good move. Um, it seems to me 
if white plays knight to b5, I can play rook to f7 and defend my c-pawn. So when the rook's on d4, it's not so easy to defend that pawn on c7. Okay, so I don't like rook d4 myself. He, he played rook back to e1. He wants to play knight b5 pretty soon. Rook c5, putting tremendous pressure on c4. We're threatening to take it with checkmate. Rook d takes c4 mate. So he's got to take the rook. Plays knight takes a4. White's won a clean pawn. Great. Although white's knight on a4 is sort of trapped. So he played rook check. He goes after that c pawn. King f6. Takes it. Knight c5. And black's trying to get counterplay. Black has a pass d pawn. Black's king can move up. White's knight on a4 is semi-trapped. So he trades knights. King has to go back here. If he takes the rook... Then we play d3. Um, I don't see a good way to stop that pawn. That's actually a pretty good trick. So he didn't take the rook. He played king b3. And now white's two pawns up and he should win. But black played for a really nice trick later. And people were arguing on the internet about what their engines were saying. One said, that's a great trick. If Kupchak fell for it, he wouldn't have won. And somebody else said, no, my computer says he's still winning. I'll let, I'll let you guys decide later. Okay, so here white, White's wrapping it up. Okay, White's up two pawns. Not, not much going on. And he played the move b4. He wants all the pawns traded. He wants to take on d4. He wants to take on d6. Okay, and Black's like, no, I'm going to take the pawn on a3. Now, the pawn on a3 is hanging with check. So White played king e4. That's an excellent move. Because now if you take the a3 pawn, then I take your d6 pawn with check. And then I take the pawn on c5. So, for example, takes, check, takes, and black's pawns are all disappearing. White's up several pawns here. Three to be exact. So instead of rook takes a3, he played the move g5, got his king up. Rook to c7, threatening the pawn. d3. He doesn't want to take on d3 because rook takes a3 is check. Then he would take on b4. So then white's pawns would all be falling. Although I'm guessing White's probably winning there. But he played the better king e3. He wants rook takes a3, and he wants to take the pawn on c5. It's not check. So d2, he still wants to check him, but no. Takes on b4, takes on b4. King f4, he's trying to get counterplay. King g3, king takes g2. Okay. And after check, black made a very sneaky move. And in this position... Black has four legal moves, and Black made the strangest move of the four. When that happens in a rook ending, when you're completely winning, like Kupchik is here, you should be suspicious. And whenever I'm completely winning and my opponent's not resigning, there's only one thing that I think of. Okay, and that's what happened here. Played King H4. Do you understand why Black played King H4? Can you figure it out? Hopefully you did. Black's trying to stalemate himself. This can't move. This can't move. This can't move. So if it's Black's turn to move, Black's going to play rook check, and he's going to keep checking, 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 checking until White takes his rook, and it's stalemate. And White's going to run his king away and try to unstalemate Black so he can safely take the rook. Now in this position, Kupchik played c5, at least I thought he did. Okay, and now you can't give your rook away because if you do, black can play d takes c5. It's not stalemate. For example, this is not stalemate because you can, you can take on c5. Okay, so instead, Bogolyubov took on c5, and now there was a big argument on the internet, okay? And it probably depends on what engine you have and how far ahead it can see. It, they said... B takes C5 would be a blunder. He didn't play B takes C5 because now Black gives his rook away and draws the game because Black is stalemated. And somebody said, no, my engine says the king does this and the king does that and the king does that and it unstalemates Black. Maybe, okay? You'd have to see many moves ahead for that to be true. And if you were wrong, you would stalemate your opponent. So for White to do this would be very silly. Even if White's winning, it's still silly 
because black has excellent drawing chances, even if it's not a draw. Um, if I were to opine, it seems like, it seems like if my king gets to g6, and then you play rook g5 check, and I play king h6, then I'm winning. Yeah, probably white's winning here, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, but anyway, Kupchik saw what Bogolyabov was doing, trying to give his rook away and get stalemated. So he played very excellent move, g3 check. Now after king h3, the only legal move... There's never going to be a stalemate. Black has king h2, black has king g2, and black has pawn h4. That's not good. If black never gets stalemate, he decided not to play on anymore and he resigned. Obviously, after king h3, b takes c5, this is a very easy win for white. So after g3 check, Bogolyabov realized that Kupchik saw the stalemate trick, and that was his only trick, and he gave up. And Kupchik was a very strong player in the 30s. He played in the Olympiad for the U.S. team. He played board three, and he won the bronze medal. He didn't lose any games. Something like 10 wins and five draws, something like that. And the U.S. won the gold medal that year that he played. And he won, so he won a gold medal for the team and a bronze medal for his board. Obviously, he was a very strong player. But again, Bogoy, um, Kupchik... Not super famous because other American players like Kajdan and Ruben Fine and Frank Marshall and I'm probably missing two or three others. Let's see, who was good in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in the U.S.? I mean, basically, I just think I'm Marshall. But um, the U.S. Did, did win the Olympiad, so obviously they had lots of good players, and Kupchik was one of them. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this game in our series of Forgotten Players of the Past. And hopefully, you won't forget them anymore. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Please like and subscribe. You can also go to my YouTube page. And Karen and I both have Twitch pages as well. I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.